Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. That's our message this morning comes from our gospel lesson. When Jesus drew near and saw the city, he wept over it. They would that you, even you, had known on this day the things that make peace. These are our mournful words of our Lord that we will meditate upon this morning, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ. Because of what Jesus saw on earth while he was here, the terrible state of things, of his creation, what we have done to it because of our sin, I'm sure it must have bought him great sadness on more than one occasion. This is the deep emotional sadness of the Creator looking upon this fallen creation. Perhaps he might have even had in mind the words that we heard from Jeremiah today as he looked upon Jerusalem. Why then has this people turned away in perpetual backsliding? They hold fast to the sea and they refuse to return we might get just a small glimpse of that kind of sadness if we are parents who have children who have walked away from faith. But there were many times that Jesus was sad because of this and other things, but this is one of the only two times in Scripture where a certain thing is recorded. Jesus was sad about the state affairs of his children and his creation, but Scripture only records him weeping twice. One time we know he wept was at the death of his dear friend Lazarus. He stood at his friend's grave and he wept. Of course he wasn't weeping because he knew that death was beyond his power. We know it wasn't because he raised Lazarus from the dead. But Jesus wept because death was so unnecessary. Death and all of its heartache is unnecessary. But we have made it necessary because of sin. All of this is so unnecessary, but this is what Jesus has come to fix, to remedy, to conquer for us by his death and resurrection. So now, here he is, looking down upon Jerusalem, and Jesus weeps again. And once again, it is because it is just so unnecessary. He, the Messiah, has finally come in fulfillment of God's promises, the very fall of mankind into sin. And since that time, all of mankind has been in spiritual warfare against the Almighty God. All through the time of the patriarchs, through the time of the sojourning in Egypt, through the exodus, through the time of the judges, through the time of the kingdoms of Israel and Judah. And even through the 400 years of silence from the last prophet spoke God's words, Right up into the time when Jesus Christ himself came, mankind had been at war with God by our sin. And I'm not talking about the Gentiles. I'm not talking about the pagans. It was God's own people who were at war with him. And this warfare of sin caused separation between God and man and between man and man. There was no peace. Because every person was looking inward, sinfully, selfishly, to themselves and their own interests, and damn anybody else. And with such an attitude, there can never be peace. There will certainly never be reconciliation. Only war. Never ending war. our desire because we like sin so much. And it is no different with you and me today. What Isaiah said all those years before still apply to us today. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. 
What was true about the time of the judges is true for us today. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. By our sin, by your and my daily sin, we are just as much at war with God as mankind has ever been. And look around you, folks, this world. This world and the people in it are getting more selfish, more self-centered every single day. Peoples are pitted against other peoples. And if you are not like me and mine, you're not just wrong, you're my enemy. And you must be crushed. You must be destroyed at all costs. For on every side.
Because people did not know, as scripture says, the time of their visitation. The Messiah has come. Come to give them peace. So he gets up, wipes away from his eye a tear of deep sadness over his mourning and oblivious children. And he takes a step, his first step toward his final journey. Jesus come because Jesus is great. The question we have to ask ourselves today is, is Jesus come for you? If he does, it's unnecessary. Just as unnecessary it was for Jerusalem on that day. You see, Jesus would so much rather rejoice over you. As scripture says, there was joy before the angel of God with one sinner who repents. Perhaps he needs to weep over you or me. Because like Jerusalem, you miss the peace that he comes to bring. Perhaps not earthly peace, though that might be a gift he chooses to give you, despite his warning that in this world you will have trouble. But he does bring a peace that he guarantees. A true peace. Peace of God. Peace for eternity. Peace because of the sins of yours that he forgives. Paid for by his sacrifice on the cross and proven by his resurrection from the grave. We too often miss the peace that is ours. Because we try to fix our sin on our own and that's just impossible. We look for peace in the princes and powers of this world but I guarantee you like all the other princes of our world, they will go to dust one day. So my friends, look only for real peace. And look for peace in the places where Jesus has delivered it to you. For our text today is for you. Would that you, even you, would know on this day the things that make for peace. Here you are in God's house on this special day of grace, this Lord's Day, as we have been invited again into His presence to receive by the Holy Spirit's chosen means the things that make for peace. Here's one. The font. This font here is a thing that makes for peace because here at this font, Water is combined with God's word and you are turned from an enemy of God, warring against him, to a dearly loved child of God who wants to live for his father. You are an heir of heaven. Your sins are washed away. This is a thing that brings real peace. This table. This table is a thing that brings peace. For here, soon, the bread and the wine will be the very body and blood of Jesus Christ given and shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. And when sins are forgiven, there is peace. And this holy book, it is a thing of peace. For here and everywhere else you receive that mighty word of God. In that word is victory, victory over sin and death and hell, and in it you have peace and life in Jesus, because as we actually just sang in our liturgy a little while ago, these things are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. So yes, would that be, even you, you would also know the time before we take. Here is the time. Jesus brings you himself right now. The Son of God comes to you here in the midst of his people. Jesus himself, his real personal presence, is the ultimate thing that makes for peace. And Jesus personally comes to you right here and right now. He says, where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am. So he's here. For we are here in his name. Where his word is, here he is. In the consecrated bread and wine, he is truly, really, presently here, personally, in our midst, to bring you forgiveness right now, here today. 
every step of your life, he is personally and present, personally present with you, just like you promised. Behold, I am with you all in the end of the age. The time of your visitation by your Savior Jesus is now. Don't miss it. Don't miss it by looking for peace somewhere else. The thing that brings peace is Jesus. Jesus. Only Jesus. He is here, really, personally here for you, in your heart, in your soul, in your ears, in your head, in your hands, in your mouth, in your soul. He is here. 